I'm Mohamed Bentires Alj. People call me Momo. My lab is at Friedrich Mischer Institute in Basel, and we focus on the cellular and molecular mechanisms regulating normal and neoplastic breast stem cells, resistance to targeted therapy, and metastasis. I'm pleased to welcome you to conversations with key figures in mammary gland biology and breast cancer. My name is Louis Cantley. I, I'm a director of the Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York Presbyterian Hospital. And the Cancer Center has recently acquired the name of the Sandra and Edward Meyer Cancer Center. So thank you, Lou, for participating at uh, this oral history of mammary gland biology and breast cancer. But before talking about your scientific career, can you tell us a bit about your personal history birthplace and childhood? So I was uh, born in Charleston, West Virginia and grew up there and uh, went to college as well in uh, West Virginia, West Virginia Wesleyan College. So up to the age of, of 22 I spent my essentially entire life in West Virginia uh, and it was, uh, it was a great place to grow up. So what made you go into science? You know. Why not art, sport, music? I know you have a lot of passions. What made you go to science? Well, the truth is, if I'd been a little bit taller and maybe a little bit faster, I would have gone into basketball. <laughs> <laughs> my first love was really, I loved, loved yeah. playing basketball. Uh, but I realized that my real talent was uh, as a scientist. My, my father was, uh, although he never went to college, was a natural scientist. He mm -hmm. was very curious about how things worked and from a very early age, he taught me how things worked, how to take engines apart and put them back together. He explained to me why it would rain, you know, what, how condensation of moisture, and etc. So he he just sort of naturally understood how things worked, and, and, and uh, he stimulated your curiosity. So I was uh, I basically felt that almost anything that happened in nature could be figured out in a logical context, and so. For me, that was I was extremely curious about how things worked. Thank you. So, Lou, you did your bachelor in chemistry in uh, West Virginia, and then did a PhD in biophysical chemistry at Cornell University in Ithaca, in the state of New York, working on enzyme kinetics <coughs> and using FRET. Can you tell us more about your PhD work? So, it, I, I w as I went to graduate school, I was very interested in recent observations about how you could couple ion gradients into ATP synthesis. The, the Mitchell hypothesis, the chemiosmotic hypothesis had just been proposed. It still wasn't that, uh, that uh, people weren't that convinced that it was true that you could couple a proton gradient, electrochemical gradient into ATP synthesis. But to me, it was an intriguing question. It was a really a question of chemistry. How do you do that? How, because it's, it seemed like this connection between life and just simple chemistry, a very mysterious thing. Uh, and so I focused on the enzyme that carried out that reaction. Initially, the mitochondrial F1 ATP synthase. Mm -hmm. uh, but later, I also worked on the chloroplast uh, version of that, the chloroplast coupling factor that synthesizes ATP in response to light energy. Uh, so converting light energy to chemi electrical chemical energy and ultimately to chemical energy uh, to me was all very mysterious and I was excited about trying to figure out how that worked. Uh, I was able, uh, it, the enzymes had been purified, I was able to uh, work on the purified enzymes, identify nucleotide binding sites and used FRET to try to understand how the proximity of these sites and how kinetically they interacted with each other during HP synthesis. So that was the topic of your thesis? Yes. So after the PhD thesis in uh, New York State, you moved to Boston, first as a postdoc, then as an assistant professor, then an associate professor at Harvard. Can you tell us more about your years as postdoc or your first years as postdoc then as an independent scientist? So when I went to Harvard as a postdoc, I all my, I'd never, actually never had a course in biology. 
all of my courses were in uh, physics Physi and chemistry, chemistry. and uh, even biochemistry. I only had one semester of biochemistry, so my real focus was on understanding chemistry. Uh, but I, of course, got very much sucked into the structural basis for how enzymes catalyze reactions. Mm -hmm. So uh, in choosing a place to do a postdoc, I was decided to work for Guido Guidotti, whose laboratory had first purified the sodium-potassium ATPase, which, like the F1 coupling factor, couples ATP energy to, nucleot to uh, ion gradients. Mm -hmm. In this case, hydrolysis of ATP, ATP driving sodium-potassium movement across the cell. So I figured the same thing as I'd learned as a graduate student would apply to this other system, which was more complicated because it was this enzyme was totally integral to the membrane and mm -hmm. couldn't be purified Purify, as yeah. a membrane-independent functional component, while the F1 ATPase, you could take it off the membrane and still get it yeah. to carry out some of its reactions. So this forced me to work with cells rather than just proteins, uh, and I slowly got sucked into not just the question of how that enzyme worked, which we understood in to some extent, short of having a crystal structure, uh -huh. but rather how that the enzymatic activities was regulated, because there was evidence that a number of growth factors, including insulin, mm -hmm. could stimulate uh, potassium efflux and sodium import into the cell. And establishing that membrane gradient was important in some cells for driving sodium-dependent amino acids or glucose uptake. So it was really quite uh, important important enzyme to, to understand. So okay. can you tell us also about your first years as independent scientist, as assistant professor and as associate professor? So as I became an assistant professor, I was uh, increasingly interested in this question of how growth factors and insulin regulate sodium potassium yes. ATPase and other transport systems. And I noticed as I reconstituted sodium potassium ATPase, that the enzyme required phosphatidyl inositol in order to be functional. And, and so I incorporated the phosphorylated forms of phosphatidyl inositol. <coughs> Excuse me. So I became interested in how growth factors regulate the enzyme. And I'd noticed if I re incorporated, if I reconstituted the enzyme, it required phosphatidyl inositol. But if I used the phosphorylated forms, and at that time we only knew of two, PI4P and PI45P2, mm -hmm. instead of phosphatidyl inositol, I got very different enzymatic activity. And it raised the possibility in my mind that phosphorylating phosphatidyl inositol could be a good way to control the activity of intrinsic membrane proteins. So that got me interested in the enzymes that carried out those phosphorylation reactions. And at that time, it was called the futile cycle. No one had any idea yeah, why yeah. you phosphorylated these lipids. They got phosphorylated, they got dephosphorylated growth factors that stimulate both effects. Mm -hmm. We knew nothing about IP3 as yeah. a signaling molecule at that time. Diacylglycerol as a PKC activator wasn't discovered until the second year that I was a, a faculty member. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about around the eight, early 80s. Yeah, 78, 70, oh, 79, 78. Uh -huh. and 80. And the IP3 as a calcium regulator wasn't discovered wasn't until discovered. 83. Yeah. Uh, so I was focusing on these more as the phosphoinositides being the regulatory events rather than the precursors of signal transduction pathways. So that um, led me, though, how to, to get deeply involved in that literature. Uh, and I was seeking evidence that phosphoinositides were stimulated, production mm -hmm. was stimulated by growth factors and how that might happen. And then along came the discovery of, of course, tyrosine kinases and that many of these growth factor receptors were tyrosine kinases. And so I was looking for the possible connection between phosphatidyl mm -hmm. inositol, uh, phosphorylation, and, 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 and tyrosine kinases. Uh, and sought such a connection when we discovered a, an enzymatic activity co-purifying with V-SARC, yes. polyamidyl T-C-SARC, PDGF receptor, etc. Yes, and that's what uh, really got me moving in that direction. So, so then you were as an independent scientist. Can you tell us that who were your role models and mentors, if any? And what did they do that was appealing to you? 
Well, I was, of course, my mentors uh, uh, included my PhD advisor, Gordon Hammes, who had, was really most famous for his uh, tech, developing techniques for measuring rapid kinetics, temperature jump, mm -hmm. and uh, such systems that would allow you to watch pre-steady state events happening in, in uh, enzymes, uh, and was one of the first to apply fluorescent probes to, to monitor changes in, mm -hmm. in binding pockets and proteins. And, of course, Guido Gudotti, whose laboratory uh, was uh, had first purified sodium potassium ATPase, but uh, who ran a laboratory that allowed people to do absolutely anything they wanted to do. And so for me, it was a perfect design, uh, environment for his postdoc because I could pursue anything I wanted to do. F. Racker had a major impact on my career. He was the person who first purified the F1 ATPase. All the components of, that required for ATP synthesis were purified in his laboratory. He was a skeptic of the chemiosmotic hypothesis at the time that I arrived in Cornell. And, uh, and there was this very uh, exciting time in my PhD thesis in which uh, um, Peter Mitchell the, the man who got the Nobel Prize for proposing the chemiosmotic hypothesis came to visit and give a talk. And uh, I just published some of my work on nucleotide binding to the F1 ATPase. And so he and F. Racker came to hear me give a short presentation on the work from my PhD thesis. Uh, there were only four of us in the room, Gordon Hems, Peter Mitchell, F. Racker, and myself, uh, in which I showed slides from the work I'd done, and of course, I was immediately interrupted with each slide by F. Racker saying, I'm not sure this could be explained by the chemiosmotic, and George course, yeah. Peter Mitchell saying, oh no, of course, this is completely consistent with, and so forth, and then the two of them would get into a huge argument, and I wouldn't get a chance to say anything, <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, very exciting to, uh, that they took my research so seriously. Uh, so I had a lot of, uh, surrounded by really a lot of brilliant people. At that time, but back then, you know, the notion of mentoring was not like today. So there was no such really thing like mentoring back then, right? Uh, for me, uh, but I thought the best possible mentoring was just uh, leaving me completely alone and letting me do anything <laughs> I wanted to do. That was the mentoring I was seeking, and, uh. and Guidotti's laboratory was perfect for that. So where was it located in Boston? Uh, in the bio labs. Okay. And yeah. of course, the bio labs were very famous. Yeah. Uh, 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 James Watson. Uh, yeah was there at the time I arrived. Uh, and in fact, uh, he left to go full-time to Cold Spring Harbor in 1978, the same year that I took the faculty position. So I inherited his office oh, wow. uh, as, as he was vacating. And, uh, and of course, there were other very famous people there. Wally Gilbert uh, was uh, just about the time I became a faculty member mm -hmm. when he discovered how to sequence DNA. Uh, and so there were a lot of, uh, Conrad Block was also one of my mentors. He, I taught introductory biochemistry uh, alongside him for several years. Uh, and so it was a chance for me to hear him explaining all of his ideas about biochemistry uh -huh. at that time as he was closing, approaching retirement. So I, had a, I was surrounded by a lot of really brilliant people. So in 1985, you became a full professor in physiology in Tufts University. And the same year, you discovered PI3 kinase. You cite this as the most surprising discovery of your team. Can you tell us more about this major discovery? How did this happen? Well, as I indicated earlier, I was really seeking some connection between growth factors, tyrosine kinases, and phosphoinositide kinases, because I really thought mm -hmm that phosphorylating this membrane-embedded lipid uh, is very likely to affect a number of things at the membrane. Uh, activities of, tr of transporters, uh, we later, of course, and others figured out that it also was affecting actin rearrangement, and of course, is a precursor for IP3 and isoglycerol downstream signaling, but at that time, we didn't really know any of that. Uh, but I was seeking the possibility of a phosphorylating the 4 or the 5 position in the ring uh, being regulated by tyrosine kinase. 
And so we found an activity co-purifying with a variety of tyrosine kinases and that the first observation was made before I moved to, to Tufts and we continued to pursue that and we assumed it was phosphorylated in the four position because that was the sure. only known That's singly phosphorylated phosphoinositide that was discovered in 1949, the year I was born. Uh, and, and in spite of many searches for others, this is all anyone could find. Uh, and so it was a shock when one day we were looking at uh, some thin layer uh, uh, assays of putting the product of PI3 kinase, uh, of the PI kinase that we had partially purified, the, the one that co-purified with tyrosine kinases, and comparing it to another more abundant PI4 kinase mm -hmm. in the cell we realized that the two were not making the same product. They migrated slightly differently on a thin layer, a millimeter difference, if you will. So many people would have missed it. It reminds me of the discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation by Tony Hunter. It's again, a little shift. That yeah, that, that shift. And, and, and had we not done every other control. spot on the thin layer as, as the what we call type 1, type okay. 2, type 1, type 2, type 1, type 2, and we noticed the spots slightly went up and down, up and down, up and down. And that, uh, and then a, it was a matter then of figuring out why it was different, what chemically was different yeah. about it. And uh, it's, we, the experiments from there were pretty straightforward. It only took us a few weeks, really, a month or so, to, to figure out what the difference was and that it was really a three position rather than a four. And that, of course, since people had been looking for any other form of phosphoinositide for 30 years without seeing it, and the fact that the enzyme that was making it was uniquely associated with tyrosine kinases, to me said that had to be really important. important yeah. Yeah. And it was a matter of figuring out then what the, and it ultimately we of course discovered a whole family of yeah. lipids that, that were, had been missed because they were only about 1% as abundant yeah, it's the low as, as the conventional PI4P and PI45P2. So how did the community, the scientific community back then receive it? Did you talk about it? Total disbelief. No one believed it for several years. And so we had no competition in the field because... Uh, so that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, lipid, the lipid chemist said, this is totally unbelievable. Uh, we've looked for this for 30 years. This is complete wrong. One person in the field said, I will eat my hat if this turns out to be true. Uh, and then in the oncogene field, where people were not really knowledgeable about lipids, lipids. so much, uh, they attempted to reproduce the results, but didn't realize that you had to sonicate the lipids mm. in order for them to be a substrate for PI kinase. So they were using detergent solubilized lipids, and the enzyme was totally dead oh. under those conditions. So a series of papers came out after that saying that n nobody in the field could reproduce the result. But they didn't have a sonifier sure. to make the lipid substrate, even though we showed in our paper yeah. in the experimental section you have to sonify the lipids. Uh, so ultimately, uh, David Kaplan and Malcolm Whitman, uh, uh, graduate students in my lab and Tom Roberts' lab, mm -hmm. went to some of the labs, Who handed really them a sonifier, and <laughs> said, "Sonify your lipids and then do your assay." And then suddenly they saw a hundredfold change when they <laughs> used the assay, and then everybody. One by one, people began to realize that it's actually and true. And admit that it's true. Yeah. But it was really about four or five years from the time we made the discovery before people really accepted it. Wow. And of course, I had no research support for it. Any yes, either. the grants, yeah, of course. But I had grants on other things. So yeah, the sure. ETPAs and all, I just used that money for. Yes, yes. I've never really paid attention to what I propose to do in a grant proposal. I always do what makes sense based on what I discover, mm. rather than what I thought was right three or four years ago, sure. which is probably, if, if you're right five years ahead of time, you're not really on the cutting edge. Yes. <laughs> it means you haven't literally learned anything. So, Lou, then you became professor of uh, cell biology at Harvard, and uh, the director of the signal transduction division. And in 2003, you co-founded the systems biology department at Harvard Medical School. Mm -hmm. What was this department about? Well, systems biology, the reason that we decided to start systems biology is the realization that we were entering a new era where um, understanding, in order to understand regulatory 
mechanisms in biology, whether they be subcellular or multicellular or organ systems, that we had the capability of generating huge amounts of data by techniques such as you know, uh, doing microarray analysis or doing mass spec proteomics globally, and that tying that back to the actual biochemical mechanisms without losing sight of the big picture really required a completely different kind of mathematics, a different kind of approach uh, to, to biology uh, and biochemistry. And so the time was right to get the people focused on asking these kinds of global questions and, and the type of mathematics you would and need to And in a dynamic way, not only, not just statistics, it's dynamic modeling. That's right. So going from the re now, I've always been the reductionist in that I always wanted to get to the detail of exactly how it works at the yes. molecular level. But if you lose sight of how that fits into the big picture, then you've really lost the ability to determine the, the importance of what you're following. So systems biology is it gives us a chance to to understand more globally what's going mm -hmm. on. Um, although it's still, I feel that one has to do perturbations. Yes. at a very to controlled level, and then watch the system respond yes, to that. Yes. And that's where, I, from my version of vision of systems biology, is that it's not just descript descriptive, but rather True. you need to intervene in some yeah. very controlled manner and then temporally watch how the system responds to that intervention. That's uh, how electricians figure out yeah. you know, defects in wiring diagrams as you do a pulse and watch what happens to the system. That's what we need to do in biological systems as well. So that's what excited me about going that direction. Then in 2007, you became the director of the cancer research program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, the teaching, one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard Medical School in Boston. And then last year, as you mentioned, you became the director of the Cancer Center at Weill Cornell in New York City. Was was this motivated by this move to the cancer and to clinic to hospitals? Was this motivated by your interest in translational research, going from the basic to systems biology translational research? Well, I was excited, but you know, by 2007, 2008, it had become very obvious that uh, the PI3 kinase pathway was a major pathway in cancer. Not only was P10 lost very frequently, but activating mutations in PIK3CA. And pharmaceutical companies were beginning to develop drugs to target the enzyme. Exactly. And uh, to me, for me, the opportunity to uh, to actually change how one does uh, medical, not only research, but also apply medical research to clinical trials to create the infrastructure that will allow us to determine which patients should respond to a drug. Mm -hmm doing mutational analysis, looking at gene expression profiles, at more aggressively doing, uh, uh, getting uh, specimens from the metastatic setting just before patients go on trials. That whole infrastructure really needed to change from the way it had been used for the previous, just for research purposes, it really needs to be used ultimately for clinical practice, but at least for clinical trials, we need to do them differently. And having been the founding member of the DFHCC, Dana Farber Harvard yeah. Cancer Center, uh, and the BI representative of that, I, I realized how what the challenges were. They're cultural challenges. Yes. Changing uh, how pathologists work, how oncologists, sure, surgeons, yeah. everybody's got to change what they need to do. So the opportunity to actually uh, have some say in how that happens at an institution to me was important. Otherwise, I would felt frustrated that sure, the discoveries I'd made would take forever to get to, yeah. properly implemented. So in, in a Nature article published in 2008, the author said, over the past 30 years or so, the ecosystems of basic and clinical research have diverged and added, the abyss left behind is sometimes labeled the valley of death. Yes. And neither basic researcher busy with discoveries nor physicians busy with patients are keen to venture there. Is it your intention to transform the valley of death to the valley of life? Exactly. 
that's uh, that's exactly what my perception was that the only way that we could transverse that valley of death is if the clinicians pathologists surgeons radiologists radiation oncologists who are actually on the front line administering drugs and running the clinical trials are talking day to day with the basic scientists who have the preclinical models that understand the pathways who know what the biomarkers are that will yes. tell them who's going to respond and whether they did respond and how to stratify the patients up front stratifying the patients but developing biomarkers that will tell you whether your drug has hit the target or not yes. in an in vivo setting uh, and then determining what the response to that target is and what the mechanisms of resistance to that target is those uh, are things that by 2007 or so, there were enough examples in, yes. in the field of Gleevec, for example, sure. where, where uh, we actually believed that our targeted therapies were really hitting the target sure. and that they could become resistant and the mechanism of which they could be resistant. That I imagined that was going to happen over and over yeah. and over again sure. with every targeted therapy. And we need to put in place an infrastructure to make that easy to tease out. It was also the time of the discovery of the mutation of EGFR, so that's the excitement. In and then the resistance, resistance sure. in EGFR were coming out as well. So it, there was, we'd reached a tipping point where even the oncologists and even the surgeons were beginning to believe, oh, this target therapy really is hitting the target. Yes. Because up until then, it was pretty much, okay, some cells died, was it because it hit the target? Who knows? Uh, but at that point, it became possible to develop uh, drug clinical trials that are really science driven, not yes. just let's throw a couple of more molecules together and hope that we get a bigger effect in either one individually. Uh, so I wanted to create an infrastructure that would make th that logic of the science be implemented in clinical trials. Now I was fortunate that I received about that same time money from Stand Up to Cancer to put together an interdisciplinary and interinstitutional team 65 people across institutions to do exactly that. I heard you several times speaking very high of this team. Can you tell us more about the composition of the team, the kind of scientists you had in the team? Well, so the team uh, consisted of people that already knew, at least the leadership on the team, were people that already knew pretty well and had already had an impact in the field. Charles Sawyers yes. had done great work in, in, uh, with Gleevec and figured out the business and mechanisms, was, was my co-chair and our co-leader. Gordon Mills, who had mm -hmm. really implemented the RPPA approach to determining protein pr levels and modifications in tumors and applying that system of biological approaches. And then site leaders like Ramon Parson, who had yes. found P10. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Roberts and I had worked together on PI3 kinase for 20 years. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, cl the clinical leaders as well. We, we had absolutely stellar clinical leaders. Uh, Jose Vasalga, who had mm -hmm. run clinical trials for Herceptin and many other targeted therapies. Uh, Eric Weiner at Dana-Farber, mm -hmm. who had done many clinical trials in, with targeted therapies in breast cancer. Uh, and uh, Carlos Artiega, who had mm -hmm. figured out t style ways and mechanisms of resistance to targeted therapies. Uh, so these, these people were uh, real leaders either from the clinical side or the basic science. So side. did you have any bioinformatician, computational biologist, statistician in the team? Uh, yes, of course. We, we had Don Barry, who's uh, very well known for designing novel clinical mm -hmm. statistical approaches for clinical trials, crossover trials, etc. I think it's important to have all of them. And of course pathologists. We had to have pathologists who had bought into the concept of getting CLIA compliant the biomarker assays developed. We needed to be able to have CLIA compliant assays for enrolling patients in our trials, uh, and then people who understood how to get mutational information out of the minimal amount of tissue you can yeah. get from a biopsy in a metastatic setting. David Solid has been a key mem member of our team and continues to be. Uh, and we all learned from each other. There was no one person on this team who knew everything. And for me, it was an incredibly educational experience because I'd never been involved in a clinical trial. And I could ask the most naive of all questions. Well, if this were a mouse, here's what we would do next. And uh, and so a lot of clinicians were rolling their eyes, and and uh, but they they realized that uh, what I'm really asking them is, do you not do it this way because it's unethical, or is it just because historically you haven't you done, done it this it. way? <laughs> and why don't we do 
do biopsies in a metastatic setting? And the answer is that you can't, not that you can't do it. Patients almost never refuse it if you ask them to. Sure. It's just inconvenient for the doctor, inconvenient. You need a good radi radiologist to, be, to, to help be you target it. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. And if it doesn't give a clear, if it, you don't think that it's going to tell you anything that's going to change the care of the patient, then, it's, then it would be unethical to do it. But in a clinical trial setting where that information is going to be crucial, crucial for deciding whether they go into the drug and determining whether they're going to respond or not, it's a different issue. And I think that uh, eventually everyone began to understand that, and as the clinicians began to understand better what we needed to know from those biopsies and what the power of that information yeah. is going to be in retrospective analysis for interpreting the clinical trial, they suddenly completely bought into this concept. And that created a lot of trust and discussion back and forth uh, in, the, in the trial design. So how often do you meet or do you communicate with each other? Well, in truth, our team has, in theory, ended. Our, tr our, our funds ran sure. out uh, right. last November. Uh, but we did have some money in escrow that will allow us to pay for the retrospective analysis mm -hmm. of tissues from the trials. And, of course, much of uh, the interpretation of those trials yet is yet to be done. Yeah, yeah. The patients are still continuing in the mm -hmm. trials. We have patients who respond for very long periods of time. Some have relapsed. In many cases, we've been able to get the primary tumor, the tumor in the metastatic setting, well, the and, and from the same patient. Yes. And then, uh, in cases where the tumor initially responded to therapy and then ultimately became Very resistant, mm -hmm. we often have a third biopsy from that same patient. So we can literally follow the evolution, the evolution of the tumor yeah, sure. in patients in the trials. And so that data is yet to be harvested. Sure. It's sitting in some of it we've already collected, but we haven't had a chance to analyze yet. We'll wait until the trials are finished to go do a deep dive yes. on all the sequence information and then write manuscripts that describe who responded, who didn't, and are there co common events. Now, of course, we're doing exactly that same thing in the mouse setting in parallel. The mouse studies are going a little faster than the human, so we already have some hypotheses as to what we expect to see. So the investigators doing the mouse work were also involved in these meetings with clinicians and with... Oh, yes, of course. Every We meet we, we have three or four times a year. We would have face-to-face -face meetings, everybody. So during with. the funding period, you used to meet three or four times a year. Yeah, and then we had uh, discussions of the clinical trials every other week. Wow. So there was a lot of communication going on uh, during this whole time. And fortunately, all the trials that we started were ultimately picked up by either pharmaceutical companies or by uh, other organizations like CTEP that, uh, that would allow us to continue the funding of the trial mm -hmm. after the standard cancer money ended. Uh, and so it's, it's been a great experience, and it still is. I'm still yeah, sure. communicating with all these people very... This should serve as a model for many other biomedical or groups. Well, I think the and key thing to make something like this work is that you have to have a focused question in mind. We just have a bunch of people who get together and say, let's do some clinical sure. trials, and it's not focused on a particular target uh, yeah. or a particular set of drugs, then it's become so diffuse that you don't even necessarily have the right expertise on the team. And that then everything falls apart into nobody knows what everyone's talking about. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> but here we were highly focused, so it was. But it needs also some kind of personality in this personalities in this team. In his book, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, the tipping point, he mentioned for something to tip, you need a connector, a maven, and salesman. So I guess you had all of these in your team and a lot of uh, interactions. Yeah, no, I, as I say, we had uh, we had leaders who were already very, very established in their field yes. who also respected each other yes. and were willing to communicate. So we would open up data, you know, everybody would see data well before there was any manuscript written. First time we had a, any kind of result that looked interesting, mm -hmm. we would show that to everyone, the clinicians, everyone. And, and often our trials were influenced by data that was far from ever getting into the public domain by publication. Uh, in the case of the trial we did with PI3 kinase inhibitor BKM120 plus a lapper of PARP inhibitor from two different companies, the actual preclinical data that supported that BRCA mutant patients in triple negative breast as well as BRCA ovarian would likely respond dramatically to that combination was based on both PDX models 
in mice as well as genetically engineered BRCA P53 models. models in mice, arriving at exactly the same conclusion from two different laboratories. And sharing that information gave us a lot of confidence across the team that, that uh, this was going to work and led to the patients actually enrolling in the trial literally three or four months before the paper ever got published showing the preclinical data. Yes. So that's, uh, you know, that's unusual for that to happen. It required a lot of trust yeah. among, among the, the team, team. Yeah. Uh, and the whole team going together to the industry sure. as a group of us saying, cool. here's the trial we think you should do. That makes a lot of difference from just one scientist sure. going to and two companies and saying, oh, believe me, this is the trial yeah. you should do. It doesn't sure. work no matter how powerful you are. Sure. Uh, but a whole team of people from bench to bedside workers agreeing on that had a big influence in getting that trial started. So, Lou, if uh, President Obama calls you tomorrow and says that he decided to make biomedical research a national priority and ask you for advice, what would you advise him? Well, I think we do need to uh, try, I think we, I, you know, I, I believe in R01 grants. I'm not going to say we should quit doing R01 grants. I think anyone who's doing great science should have an R01 grant that allows them, two or even three if possible, to allow them to implement the ideas that they have. But getting people, in addition to their investigator-initiated small laboratory approaches, also at the same time involved in a team, and a team that has a clear mission and, and a set of leaders who know what the mission is, and it's a mission that everybody believes is, 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 can work, is these, I think we have to put money into these mission statements. And they have to be timely. Yes. There has to be a period of time where you say, we have a breakthrough. Let's say BRAF mutant melanoma, mm -hmm. and we have a breakthrough. And, or uh, uh, immunological approaches, CTLA-4 yeah. targeting sure. melanoma. Here's melanoma, which really hadn't moved much for 30 years, 30 years of yeah. research. And suddenly, within a period of three or four years, sure. we have two different approaches that look extremely promising. But there's still the majority of patients with melanoma don't respond to either one of those approaches or only have a short time response. But having the foot in the door, you could now say, now is the time to throw, to put a team together that fully believes this is saw it, that we can do it. We can actually cure melanoma or at least get it early enough to prevent it from getting to a stage where it's incurable. And uh, you that's, the when, money you, for that. that's when you need to dedicate the money to it. And you've got to pick a team and a series of leaders to do it. If we look at a couple of successes we had in the past in science, one was um, making the atomic bomb. Yes. When it became obvious it was possible to make an atomic bomb, then putting a team together of the leaders who knew every aspect of what was needed to do it, the mathematicians, the people who could purify the isotopes, the people who understood how to put it together, uh, and engineers uh, working as a team, it was remarkable how fast that happened. Sure, yeah. Same thing with going to the moon. Yes. But at the time, you know, the decision to go to the moon in 1960, we knew it was possible to go to the moon. It was a matter of engineering. And the same thing with the atomic bomb. We knew it was possible to make it. It was a matter of engineering and solving some solvable, what everybody agreed were solvable problems in, in chemistry or physics. And so that's where I think every now and then in biological questions, we reach that period where, yes, we have a foothold in the door. We think a scientific approach committed to it and believe in it can actually have a big impact right now. That's when you need to throw the team at it. So I find that sometimes we throw a lot of money at something that uh, but we don't really know what to do. And in my opinion, if you don't really know what to do, now that's the time to do R01 grants and let everybody kind of go their own way until you get a breakthrough and then you form the team and bring it to the finish. So a combination of let's continue R01 grants, particularly in areas where we don't have a foothold yet. Once we have a foothold and we kind of know what to do next, that's when you need the team to attack it and, and implement the uh, approaches that are going to get you to a therapy yes. to, to solve that disease. Thank you.